thank you so much for watching. My name is Sandra Weiss and I'm a media executive at Redfin Digital. And I'll be talking about the age of Asia, master and scaling sales in China and Southeast Asia. So obviously these two regions are massive and there's a lot that could be covered. Um, so in these 10 minutes, I'll just be providing a little bit of background and market overview, uh, and then going into key takeaways, challenges, and insights for brand entry and for sales growth in, um, in these two regions. So before I start a little bit about us, Redfin Digital is a leading brand um, management agency that develops, manages, and distributes brands across Southeast Asia. And then jumping right into it. So Southeast Asia and China have emerged as an exciting export market for foreign brands um, with over 600 million uh, people within Southeast Asia and then about 1.4 billion in China. So especially over the past decade or so, these regions, they've seen an impressive growth in urbanization, the emergence of a middle class, um, the increased use of digital technologies, including mobile devices and including internet access and then improved infrastructure that ha has helped with logistics and shipping. So all of these have been factors that have helped to drive growth in the region and in these markets. Um, and then I, before I go any further, I just want to note that although I will be discussing all of Southeast Asia, the countries within this region are very different, um, especially in terms of culture, cultural norms, religion, consumer preferences, um, demographics. And so if you're looking into growing your sales in each of these individual countries, you do have to look at them individually. And you do have to assess the category or the market within each of these countries um, on its own without like, uh, conflating them into one, essentially. Um, so in this chart to the right, you can see that uh, the food and beverage market and then the, be the beauty and health market have seen impressive growth over or ha are, have seen impressive growth over the past couple of years and is predicted to continue having um, high growth until 2025, which is uh, which this chart predicts to. And then in comparison to China, although China is still seeing growth. Um, the, the categories within China have become more saturated and competitive. So this, the growth is slowing compared to countries like Philippines and Vietnam, where the growth is quite high. Um, so then the first question becomes why e-commerce at all? So e-commerce is a good starting point for most of these regions. And um, until recently, you could say that Southeast Asia has been overshadowed digitally when compared to China. Um, with impediments being the poor infrastructure, the lack of internet. And as I mentioned, all of these points have been improving in these countries, which is why um, which is why e-commerce and digitalization have been such keywords in the region. And this is especially evident um, because of or after COVID-19, which has caused a shift in consumer behavior, pushing a lot of people to start purchasing online because of lockdowns or because of uh, inability to access offline um, purchasing channels. Um, so across the region, this has meant that more people are buying more products and more types of products across um, a wider variety of e-commerce platforms. And in fact, it's estimated that 60 million people in Southeast Asia became new internet users post COVID-19. And the um, protected growth for 20, the protected e-commerce sales growth in 2022 for the region was 20.6, which is the highest in the world. And then the top countries for e-commerce growth within Southeast Asia include Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And then these five countries are, are actually also among the top 10 countries in the world when it comes to e-commerce growth. Um, although uh, although e-commerce is such a trend and, and it's a trend that's going to keep continuing over the next couple of years, it is important to note that it's a good starting point, but it should not be the end goal, especially for Southeast Asia. Um, in China, the market is much bigger, so you might be able to get away with it. But for example, in this chart over here, you can see that although the growth in China for e-commerce from uh, in, in terms of the total share of the the share of the total retail sales has grown from 10.8% in 2015 to 27.2% in 2022. Um, that still leaves a huge amount of the market that's still completely offline. And then this market is even bigger when it comes to Vietnam and in um, which saw a growth from 2.8% to 7.5% in 2022. And then Indonesia, which is predicted uh, or Indonesia, which had a 4% um, market share of e-commerce in comparison to the total to, total retail sales in 2019. Um, and then all of these numbers, they're growing, but they're still a small part of the market. Um, so that's why brands should start off with looking, or one of the suggestions is for brands to look at e-commerce as the starting point and then expand offline and expand into other channels as well. Um, so key points of expansion into Southeast Asia and China. So the first thing to note, as I mentioned, is that Southeast Asia is not homogenous. So each country in Southeast Asia has its own customs, product preferences, languages, religion, um, consumers, 
And so each of these countries will require their own level of localization um, for success. So localization can be done by creating localized creative assets, by creating campaigns that are um, more relevant or more fitted to the customs and the habits of the, of the people of that country, uh, or by working with local influencers that can help to um, promote and adapt the products to the country as well. And another point is that um, Southeast Asia is still still has high potential for uh, brands because it's not yet a saturated mar market. It's still developing. It's still maturing. And there's less competition when it comes to the number of foreign brands that are already in market, especially compared to China or um, to Singapore as well, um, where there's already quite a few foreign brands in market. So if you enter the rest of Southeast Asia, there's still that first mover advantage that brands can um, tap into, essentially. And then um, when it comes to demographics in the region, Southeast Asia tends to have a younger proportion of people who are just entering the, mar the workforce, they're increasing their income level their, and their consumption power, and they've grown up alongside um, the digital ecosystem. So they're very familiar with the uh, with e-commerce, with um, social media, with the, the entire digital ecosphere, essentially. And this is in comparison to China, which has more of an aging population. And for example, in this chart, you can see that Singapore has the highest proportion of, um, of people above the age of, 60, of, of 55 in comparison to Vietnam, which has around 80% of its population under the age of, 50, uh, of 54. And then two key mistakes that brands make when they're expanding into Southeast Asia and China is the first, not protecting their IP or trademark uh, appropriately. So this is a common mistake and one that can cause a lot of legal headaches later on and can cause like um, trademark arguments or it can cause, and it can even impact sales and growth and can damage the brand reputation if other companies or other brands start using your trademark without your permission and infringing on your brand reputation in market. Um, so that's why protecting your IP is so important because it just protects, it protects your brand and it protects your brand longevity and your brand values. And then even in some of these countries, like in China and Vietnam, they have a first to file system of trademark registration, which means that trademark is granted to the earliest applicants. So that's why you kind of want to, um, want to protect your trademark and uh, register your intellectual property as soon as possible. And then the second mistake that a lot of brands make is balancing brand control with limiting brand potential in market. So this has to do with, um, with working with agencies in the market. So for example, agencies, distributors, or other partners in market, and then allowing them the freedom to adapt the brand to the country and adapt the, the messaging to the country without completely taking away from the global identity of um, the brand. So in order to balance this appropriately, you really need to find partners that you can trust, that you've conducted due diligence on, and that you know will protect your brand identity without um, damaging it. And this will prevent you from losing control over the brand as well. Um, and then just having the products available in stores is not enough for growing sales. So to succeed in the long, long term and to build up your sales and market, brands need to develop a digital marketing strategy. And um, to do this, uh, you need to open up an official account on social media and um, so that you have that direct point of contact with your with your consumers and they can check online, whether it's uh, in, in China, the social media platforms would be Little Red Book, um, Douyin, which is the Chinese version of TikTok, Weibo, and WeChat. And then in the rest of Southeast Asia, it'd be the similar ones to Europe. So it'd be Facebook, Instagram, um, tw uh, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And then some countries also have their country specific ones. Like for example, in Vietnam, there's Zalo. Um, and just having a presence on these platforms can really help to um, provide a source of information about your brand and about your products. And then brands should also invest in promotional tools and advertisements across e-commerce and social platforms. So a lot of these platforms will have options for boosting their posts or um, for having, uh, for um, optimizing your keywords for um, search engine marketing for their specific platform, specific search engines. And then also for having your products, for example, on e-commerce platforms show up in specific locations so that uh, it increases the views and the reach of whatever you're promoting, whether it's product or a specific content piece. And then the final way is, or one of the, one of an additional way is to work with key opinion leaders, which is essentially influencers. Um, it's a term that's frequently used alongside influencers in Southeast Asia and key opinion consumers, which are consumers who have influence within their friend circle or within their family. Um, and so these consumers can help to spread word of mouth for your brand and can improve 
and it can increase brand awareness organically-ish, um, depending on whether it's a trade promotion or, and they, uh, they can also just help to boost your brand credibility and um, be kind of an advocate for your brand in a way that feels more authentic and trustworthy. Um, so just on another point on how important social media is for um, for brand discovery within Southeast Asia, in a recent cut study conducted in 2022, about 40% of respondents within Southeast Asia said that the most popular method through which they found about, out about new items was social media. So that's almost half of the people who responded said that social media was um, the most important way through which they found um, a product. And then video alone makes up 21% of online discovery. So that just kind of shows the importance of social media and um, the growth of video when it comes to the types of content that uh, helps to introduce brands and introduce brands and introduce products to consumers in market. And then here is a graph from a step-by-step -step process of market entry and brand building. Um, so this is kind of the key points that brands need to consider when they're uh, both building up a brand and building up sales. Um, although this is more market entry. Um, so for example, brands need to understand the market and the category opportunity. And this is very specific to each country. And um, they also have to do their IP considerations and trademarking, ensuring that everything is protected prior to market entry. They have to know the consumer trends within each country. And then also they can conduct focus groups or social listening um, to get direct feedback from consumers within uh, specific regions or within specific demographics to get improvements and suggestions on their products. Um, and then consider how to localize their products to market. So localize can include um, slogans, headlines, the timing of posts, the different functions to promote, the unique selling points that would be the most appealing for each market. All of these are kind of considerations within localization. And then brands should also understand the import regulations and the free trade agreements that would apply to them um, when entering whatever country it is within Southeast Asia. And then they should understand how to price their products so that they're competitive, but still maintain, um, whether it's a premium brand, they, they still have that premium level of pricing. Um, and then brands should consider how they want to enter the market, whether it's through establishing an entity in the country, working with a distributor, um, going direct through e-commerce or uh, establishing a joint venture, for example, these are all methods of market entry for brands. Um, and then brands should know the e-commerce platforms that are most popular and that um, would apply to them within these regions. So in China, the two big ones would be Tmall, which is owned by Alibaba and JD.com. And then in the rest of Southeast Asia, um, the two prominent ones that kind of have a presence across multiple of these countries are Shopee and Lazada. And of course, there are some um, e-commerce platforms that are specific to different countries um, that are also very big. So for example, Tokopedia in Indonesia is big, but Shopee and Lazada are basically the main ones for foreign brands wanting to enter um, into Southeast Asia. And then social commerce is the combination of e-commerce and um, and social media, and it's become a rising phenomenon. Phenomenon where consumers are starting to uh, they're starting to in shop and obtain entertainment at the same time. So they'll be on, um, for example, they'll be on TikTok and they'll be looking at a live stream and they'll just purchase directly on the live stream. And that's something that was actually recently implemented in Vietnam just last year. So um, they've started allowing for TikTok uh, shops to open up. And this is something that um, a lot of different social media platforms are actually pushing and that a lot of consumers are starting to adapt or um, starting to show these behavior trends where they're just shopping directly on social media platforms. And then content and influencer or KOL marketing to improve your brand um, knowledge, to educate the consumers about your brand, and then helping to build the brand up within that uh, region or that country. And then testing and learning is essential for brand success because these countries are also different. It's important for brands to um, be flexible in be flexible in the type of language that use, the creative assets that are used, but still ensure that everything is in line with their brand identity, their overarching global brand identity, so that it's still recognizably their brand. Um, so things that things that um, can be tested and learned include the names um, of different products or nicknames that are used, the slogans, the headlines, um, the designs and visuals, the coloration that is used, um, whether, for example, a product image has a person in it or it's just a product image to see which types of products or which types of creative assets perform better. Um, and that's just really important for uh, just ensuring that you're continually optimizing your strategy for the specific market and you're, you're continually optimizing your strategy for sales and to increase your return on investment in whatever um, marketing method that you're choosing. 
So thank you so much for listening. Um, once again, my name is Sandra Weiss. I'm a media executive at Redford Digital. And if you have any questions about the presentation, feel free to reach out. My email is and my phone number are on the screen right now. And if you want to learn more about us, um, the website is also on the screen. Thank you.